It's so great to be back together with you today as we continue on in this part two of our uh, study of the book of Revelation chapter eight. Last week we watched as this seventh seal was opened by the Lord Jesus. And you'll recall that John tells us that uh, there was no one in heaven who could open the scroll except the Lord Jesus. No one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. And so here we've been going through and we got to the seventh seal, which unleashed seven trumpet judgments. The beginning of these seven trumpet judgments is where God begins to pour out judgment on heaven and earth. Last week, we looked at the first four of those trumpet judgments, and today we'll look at the next two. Allow me to pray, and then we'll dig in. Father, we thank you for this time in your word today. I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would understand this text. God, that we would really be impacted by your word as we turn to it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the trumpets warn us that judgment is coming. In fact, this is my key thought for the day. The trumpets warn us that judgment is certain and to keep our faith firmly fixed on Christ, who is the God of both the natural and the supernatural. And today we make a shift. Last week we looked at the natural judgments, the, or seemingly natural judgments that came upon the earth with the first four trumpets, and this week we're going to see things take a turn to the supernatural. If you were with us last week, we saw that the first trumpet uh, brought devastation upon the earth. The second trumpet brought devastation to the seas. By earth I meant dry land. Uh, to the seas. The third brought devastation to the fresh water, and the fourth trumpet brought devastation in the heavens. And now an unusual event takes place in verse 13 of chapter 8. The Bible says, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Whoa! Whoa! Woe to those who dwell on the earth! at the blasts of the other trumpet that the three angels are about to blow. Now, some of you will recall that back in chapter 4, John described the four living creatures who surrounded the throne. One was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third had the face of a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. This could actually be the same creature that we met back in chapter 4, although we can't say with absolute certainty. You'll uh, notice that the eagle called out, Woe, three times. That is significant because there are three more trumpet, trumpets to be sounded, which are often referred to as the woes. It's almost as if the eagle is declaring, You thought it was bad when God poured out judgment upon the natural world? Wait until he unleashes it on the supernatural. That phrase, those who dwell on the earth, is actually found 12 times in Revelation. Scholars tell us that, that this phrase is more than just about the people who live on the earth, because everybody who is alive lives on the earth. What it's actually referring to is a kind of people. It's actually referring to those who live for the earth and the for the things of the earth. And so if you want to take notes today, you can write, put this down as Roman numeral number one. Woe to those who reject the gospel. Woe to those who reject the gospel. The kind of people who reject the gospel are actually those who are opposite of we who have our citizenship in heaven. In Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. He is brought to tears over this fact. And the fact is that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is perdition, whose God is the belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things for our citizenship, that's us Christians, is in heaven, whence we wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Isn't that exciting? John will unpack this more when we get to chapter 13, where we will see that Antichrist worship will become the norm during the tribulation. But you'll recall back in chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, that people will recognize in this time period, people will recognize these disasters are coming from God. In fact, if you're taking notes, you can write this down as letter A. They will acknowledge the author. They will acknowledge the author. Remember when God created this beautiful blue planet and hung it in space? There was unity between heaven and earth. In st uh, until uh, Satan tempted our ancestors to focus on the earth instead of honoring God and obeying his will. And since that time, there has been this great gulf fixed between heaven and earth. Of course, we Christians rejoice that this chasm was bridged when God's Son came to earth and died for the sins of the world. So this eagle is calling out his warning in chapter 8, and he closes with, uh, it, and chapter 8 closes with three more trumpets to sound. Uh, chapter 9 of Revelation, verse 1, the Bible says, And the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And I saw a star fall from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the bottomless, to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. So, who is this being? described as a star fallen from heaven to earth who unlocks the shaft of the bottomless pit. And what is this bottomless pit we see described here? The pit is literally the pit of the abyss. Luke gives us some information on this back in chapter 8 of his gospel. When you recall, Jesus had expelled some demons from a, a demon-possessed person, and the demons begged him. They begged Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss. We also know that later on in Revelation, uh, Satan will be jailed there uh, during the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. In fact, it so clearly descri describes Satan being locked up during the millennium. It's one, this is one of the more difficult issues for those who do not see a, a literal millennium, and it's one of the difficult issues that they have to address in their understanding. It's out of this same abyss which the Antichrist, also known as the beast, will come up out of in a, a couple chapters later on. So this is obviously uh, so this is obviously part of the underworld and it is obviously under the Lord's authority because this being who is being referred to as the fallen star is a being who also reigns as king over the beings in the pit. We'll see that more clearly when we get to verse 11. This king does not have complete authority, though, or autonomy in the abyss, because we see that the key had to be given to him before he could lose his army. So it's very likely that this star is Satan himself. Luke tells us that Jesus said to his disciples, I beheld Satan fallen as lightning from heaven. And that was in chapter 10 of Luke. So Satan is given this key. The, the, the pit is opened and the smoke comes billowing out, just as if you'd opened up a furnace. And this baby is belching out pollution. <laughs> you notice what it does to the air and sunlight in verse 2. So even though the fourth trumpet, uh, as we saw last week, had already darkened the sky, this smoke adds to the problem. But wait, it gets worse. <laughs> because out of this pit comes an army of demons. No wonder the eagle said, whoa, <laughs> whoa. Check it out in verse 3. He says, Then from the smoke came locusts of the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. This demonic army is compared to locusts, and they have one purpose. 
to terrorize mankind, specifically those who have not been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Last week we noticed how many of these judgments paralleled the plagues which came upon Egypt, and again we're reminded of Exodus chapter 10, where the eighth plague was a devastating swarm of locusts. There is a plague of locusts actually going on right now in many of the nations of Africa. Excuse me. And uh, yeah, uh, just go and do a word search and check it out. Just say uh, locust plague 2019 20 and you'll get it. Uh, but let me tell you right now, many, many countries in Africa face not only the COVID-19 pandemic, but a devastation of their food supply. And this is just the natural world being the natural world. Now, don't freak out because real locusts don't have scorpion-like stings in their tails. Thank heaven. But these critters coming up out of the abyss are not literal locusts. In fact, they do not even devour the green vegetation. God prohibits them from doing so. This demonic army is assigned one task, to torment those who have not been protected by the seal of the living God. We know that the 144,000 witnesses from the 12 tribes of Israel will escape this painful judgment. But I believe that all Christians will be sealed during the tribulation and will be protected from the torment coming from God. The lifespan of a, of a locust is usually five months from May through September, and this is how long the judgment will last. Remember, we're reading about a time frame now, a time, a seven-year time period called the tribulation. Check it out, uh, verse 5. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. These creatures have quite a detailed description. They have, they have bodies like horses and faces like men. Their heads are covered with long hair. They have teeth like lions and their skin is like a coat of mail and, and he tells us that when they fly they make a, a noise like a herd of chariots actually I, I put in the word herd <laughs> an army of chariots rushing by obviously John is using some symbolic language here to paint a picture with words there's no need to try to spiritualize these symbols or attempt to interpret them as some do as weapons of modern warfare John is using symbolic language here, keeping up image upon image in order to force us to feel the horror of this judgment. Actual locusts do not have a king, but this army follows the rule of Satan, the angel of the bottomless pit, the destroyer. In John's gospel, he says the thief, referring to Satan, comes in to steal to kill and what? Destroy. John 10.10. 10. To steal and to kill and destroy. Real locusts are pervasive destroyers, devastating everything green in their path. But this army tortures only those who do not belong to the Lord Jesus. These demonic beings described as locusts do have a king. Look with me at verse 11. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. In Hebrew, his name is Abaddon, and in Greek, he's called Apollyon. The name Abaddon means destruction. Apollyon is the Greek word, and it means destroyer. Uh, and then it says, the first woe has passed. Behold, or look, two more woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God. Uh, it's pretty clear that this is just a single solitary voice saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels 
who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. You remember last week we were at the golden altar of incense where the angel offered the prayers to the saints. And now from the same altar comes this voice commanding that these four angels be loosened. These are apparently wicked angels. Uh, all demons were angels originally. You know that. So, um, But I say, uh, I say that because a righteous angel would never have to be bound by God. And each of these angels is in charge of a vast army which follows after them when they are loosened. And this is an army of 200 million beings. This number is so huge we might be tempted to discount it as an exaggerated number. But John anticipates this because the number is so huge, and he tells us the number, and then he said, I heard their number. I remember back in the 70s, uh, several books were coming out about, uh, you know, the late great planet Earth and others, and, and people got super engaged with this idea uh, because China had uh, braggingly said that they had a 200 million man army. But I don't think this is a literal army of men. For one reason, the emphasis is on the horses, not the riders. See what I'm saying? The, and the description doesn't fit any modern warfare equipment like tanks. And so to assert that this is a nation such as China, I think, is to miss what John is trying to convey. The deadly power of these horses is in their mouth and in their tail, not their legs. These things are like biting serpents, and they can attack a man from the front or the back. And remember, we've been going through uh, Revelation during the opening of the seals, the, that a, a fourth of mankind, in those first seven seals, first six actually, we saw that a fourth of mankind had already died. And now, with this trumpet sounding, that percentage of the world's population that will have died will be approximately half of the people that were alive at the beginning of the tribulation. One would think that watching half the world's population die and five months of torment would cause people to repent. But that's not the case. In fact, write this down as letter B, if you're taking notes, they will refuse to repent. They will refuse to repent. Look at verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. One of the most chilling things about Revelation chapter 9 is not the judgments that God sends, and they are chilling, but that those who remain alive on the planet persist in sinning even during the very time God is judging them. People think they're doing their own thing. Many declare themselves agnostic as if they just don't know whether or not there's a God. But the reality is, and you can write this down as C, they will not be neutral. They will not be neutral. They will be worshiping Satan, who, by the way, has always wanted to be worshiped. In fact, there will be a, a great deal of quote, religion, end quote, at this time period. And friends, were it not for the work of Jesus, you and I would be right there with him. But we have been delivered out of that domain. Listen to the way Paul describes it to the Colossian, Colossian church. 
verse uh, 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sin that's chapter 1 verse 13 of colossians what a great promise <laughs> we've been delivered out of the domain of darkness the domain we've been delivered out of things like demon worship idolatry murder and theft sexual immorality that word that's translated sorcery is the Greek word pharmakia. <laughs> Guess what that means? Yeah, we though, like the word pharmacy, it means the use of drugs. It's not too difficult to imagine drug use being absolutely off the charts as these trumpet judgments are hurled against the earth. Probably be a lot of drug use going on as a coping mechanism when those scorpion stings torment too just thinking okay write this down as roman numeral number two if you're taking notes those who reject the gospel are aligned with the enemy those who reject the gospel are aligned with the enemy mankind lies smack dab in the middle of two opposing spiritual spheres each desiring people to conform people to itself the sphere of heaven and the domain of darkness. You are either a part of the domain of darkness or the kingdom of God's beloved Son, as we read in Colossians. As we yield either to one sphere or the other, we either become aligned with the kingdom of God or to fail to align with him, we end up many by default just being aligned with Satan's domain of darkness. We either become the companion of God's holy angels with them watching out for us or we become the companions of demons but not only are the people of this time uh, aligned with him worshiping him and his demons these trumpets sounded by the fifth and sixth angel accomplish several other things i'm going to give them to you kind of quick here a b and c pretty quick we see that as these two trumpet sounds there is the release of the demonic on the earth. The release of the demonic on the earth. In the fifth and tri uh, sixth trumpets, we see this, write this down as, a, as letter A. The release of the demonic straight out of the pit. Imagine if we opened all the doors of all the prisons all around the world. Something far worse than that is going to happen when these demons are turned loose. Yeah. But then, in the, in the fifth trumpet, where death was being denied people, now with the release of the, uh, as we saw in the release of these demonic locusts, in the sixth trumpet, we see, and this is letter B, that we see death return, or the return of death. I was trying to go with our words. You had the release of the demonic. Now you've got the return of death. Okay, following so far? Good. So far, so good. Now with half the world's population, this would be billions. <laughs> billions and billions. Oh, my goodness. About three and a half billion people. But in spite of knowing that God was the one who was the author, in spite of knowing that God was at work, they curse him and continue to worship the enemy of their souls. Write this down as C. The reaction of the defiant. The reaction of the defiant. Friends, there is coming a time when the siren call of hell will be all but irresistible to the people of the day. In spite of the 144,000 evangelists around the globe and the two witnesses that we'll be looking at in a week or two, they ignore the life-giving gospel as they are lured to their destruction by what the Bible calls the passing pleasures of sin. The reaction of the defiant.
says the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands so as to not worship demons. They would not repent of their idols or their murders or their drug use or their thefts or their sexual immorality. I guess on the one hand, it shouldn't surprise us too much that the people of the day will be rejecting these Jewish evangelists and the two witnesses, and even it even talks about an, uh, an angelic witness in the sky and all the other Christians. In the same way, people rejected Jesus in spite of seeing his miracle, in spite of his powerful preaching. Us pastors, I guess, should re realize we are in good company sometimes when our messages are rejected. In spite of the proof of his resurrection, they will fulfill the words of Isaiah the prophet where he said, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of, of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah tells us that God actually blinded their eyes and hardens their heart so they could not see with their eyes or perceive in their heart. Wow, friends, as the people of God, we can be so thankful that Jesus Christ holds the keys of death and hell. Not only that, but he exercises divine authority even over Satan and his demonic horde. God is working out his plan in his time and nothing. Not the schemes of Satan or the sins of man are going to hinder him from accomplishing his will. And his trumpet call reminds us that judgment is certain. And we need to keep our faith firmly fixed on the Lord Jesus and on our God, who is the God of both the natural and the supernatural. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. This is such a, a sobering message to have to preach on, have to teach on, Lord, but so critical. I do pray that your word would not return void, that that as people see these trumpet judgments coming, that they would recognize that they're, they're coming in exactly the way you predicted and in, in the exact order with the same type of devastation as you foretell. And so, Father, we pray that, that this truth would be evident and that you would call many, many people, millions or billions of people to Jesus during this time we're talking about here. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. Hey, it's been great to be with you today. And uh, I sure hope you're enjoying these messages from Revelation. And uh, as we next week go to the last trumpet judgment, the seventh trumpet, which will open up the bowl judgments, which are even, they're like the trumpet judgments on steroids. So anyway, oh my goodness, this is an amazing thing to have to teach through, but it's going to be an amazing time. And uh, so I hope you're uh, sharing these messages with friends and uh, family who need to hear from God's word each week. So thank you all for joining me. Thank you for uh, you who are subscribing. I appreciate that very much. And uh, we'll see you back here. Should the Lord tarry another week, we'll see you back here. Uh, for that seventh trumpet blast, the sound of judgment, part three. All right, take care. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.